Hello, my name is AJ Fjorman. I am the founder of my own consultancy, AJ Fjorman Communications, and I am also a publicist and social media strategist. AJ Fjorman, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm really excited to have you. You are a firecracker to say the least. And <laughs> thank you. I, yeah. Question and, mark. <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and, and really a multi hyphenate creative. You're so much more than just a publicist. I want to give the audience a deeper sense of who you are. I'm going to read from a short bio. And okay. like I always say, this is the internet. So if you think something needs to be amended or corrected, just let me know at the end. Sure. AJ Fuhrman is a public relations executive with experience representing clients across the entertainment, lifestyle, and technology industries. She specializes in planning and executing innovative campaigns that include both traditional and digital mechanics, as well as blogger and influence, influencer outreach initiatives. She's the founder and CEO of AJ Fuhrman Communications, and most recently was the director of public relations and social media for independent film distributor, Gravitas Ventures, which Bonsai has a wonderful relationship with. Uh, we love oh, Nolan and uh, his brother, and all Brendan. of our films are distributed through Gravitas. So, oh, um, was that yeah. was that the case when I was there, or is that new? Were you there? I think you were there between 2017 and 2019. I just, well, yeah, I was. I was. I left at. I left around Christmas time in 2017. So so that would be a little bit of overlap there, I think. Maybe just slightly. We, we love Lindsay. We love uh, Mary. Lindsay's not there anymore, but I love her too. Yeah. She's gone. And, and she got a really wonderful, not that working at Gravitas isn't wonderful, but she got a really wonderful new job and, uh, and well-deserved. So Lindsay Moffat, if you're out there, congrats. Hi, Lindsay. Uh, on on your success. Um, I know that this audience will want to hear from you about the role of PR in a successful film branding and marketing campaign. I know that me and you have talked offline about this a lot, but before we get into that, you've had such a rich existence. I kind of want to get into you a little bit and just ask you how growing up in your household was. Can you describe to us what growing up in the Fuhrman household was like? Oh my gosh, what a deep cut. Um, Well, I'm born and raised Los Angeles uh, native. Uh, I am an actual Valley girl. If you've ever heard that expression, Valley girl, I was born in the San Fernando Valley. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Um, You know, what was it like? My parents were amazing. There was never, you know, at one point I wanted to be a singer and a dancer on Broadway. My parents were always just, whatever we wanted to do, they were supportive of. Um, I started off college in Arizona and then decided I wanted to go to film school at NYU and they said, okay. You know, they were just wonderfully supportive, um, big fans of the arts, even though they themselves were not particularly involved in it. In fact, my father was famously tone deaf. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you know, we saw a lot of plays and movies and were involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. I would say my upbringing was busy. Um, I was always taking on projects and and running for positions. And I was an editor on the school paper. And yeah, so all the things, all the things. I was pretty much how I am now. My fingers in lots of pots and um, not really good at sitting still. Did your parents encourage your voice even when your voice was getting you in trouble, let's say with Miss Brokaw when you were in second grade and just talking too much? Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, (laughs) Questionable. I used to bring home report cards that, you know, back when they did report cards, I don't know if they still do. uh, And they would pretty much always say, you know, Amanda's very bright and very creative, but she talks too much and she doodles. In fact, my nickname for a while was Doodlebug. I was constantly like doodling on the sides of my paper or on the backs. Um, Were they supportive? I mean, they weren't like furious with me by any means, but you know, they did want me to behave in school and not bring home bad notes. And the older I got, the better I got at controlling those tendencies. (laughs) So, Did you get 
a pass with sort of the teachers and your parents because your grades were always great? Like, was that sort of the crutch? Like, I, I'm I'm going to talk and be my bubbly self, but I'm not a bad student on top of that. Well, my grades were not always perfect. I I was probably like an A-ish student. Yeah, like I mean, math you went to and... NYU, you went to USC. I don't think your grades were bad. <laughs> well, math and science were never my thing, right? Um, especially geometry. Oh, my God. Um, but, uh, my brother is like super excellent at math as was my father. So I did Mm. not inherit that gift, but did I get a little latitude? Um, yeah, maybe like, like once I started doing plays in high school, right? Like my English teacher said, if I performed one of my Shakespearean monologues in class, he'd give me extra credit, right? No one else had that opportunity, but because I was in a Midsummer Night's Dream, Mr. Perry was like, you know, perform your monologue. Um, I think some teachers were just being supportive of the fact that I was involved in these particular things, but I think they were also supportive of football players and cheerleaders. And, you know, I I went to a high school that wasn't like huge. It wasn't small, but everyone knew who everyone was. And that was really nice. Yeah. I think it's a fun thing to say in a sort of a, a, a cute and feel good bubbly thing to say out loud that like, you know, everybody uh, is on a level playing field and and deserves the same exceptions. But it's just kind of not the human way, is it? Like, I don't know if you agree with that. Like, if you're a talented football player, you mentioned football player. If you're a talented football player or a popular cheerleader, or if you have the gift of gab like you do and you're in plays, Mm -hmm. there is a reason for a teacher or a parent or someone to give you a little bit of, leeway yeah and some teachers are better about than others right like we all had our favorite teachers but we also all have our least favorite teachers I certainly remember stories about both um there are actually a couple teachers I loved so much that I'm still in touch with them I'm friends with them on Facebook yeah um you know so that's how much I loved those guys Um, I need to be much better about that Yeah, I mean, it's not something I necessarily set out to do, but social media made that possible, right? Um, Mr. Perry, the teacher I just mentioned, is basically the reason that I loved writing. Like, he really taught me what the point of it was. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm friends with him on Facebook. I have gone back and spoken to his students. I constantly mention and praise him. He probably gets embarrassed because that's how (laughs) he is. Um, But yeah, so... Yeah, uh, I, I do need to get in touch with some of those teachers. I mean, you know, they love it from. from, from yeah, they, they love to sort of see because they know they played a role in whoever you are today. And right. And they don't get enough credit for it ever, ever. Not enough credit. They also don't get money. paid enough for it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing, AJ. Like it's. Yeah, it's true. Now, I do remember my first grade teacher when I was around seven or six. So the same age that you were you know, like talking too much in class, but, you know, do, but, but it was okay. I think my teacher was an old lady named Miss Moon and she used to beat my knuckles with a marker every mm-hmm. time I got out of line. Yeah. My, uh, uh, and, my, uh, sorry, you know, go ahead. And, and no. I, I should probably remember more about her than that. I, I think she also was the one that let me know that there were 31 days in the month of August. And I was convinced there were 30 because my birthday is August 30th. <laughs> and my parents, my mother specifically, had always told me my birthday was the last day of the month. Oh, that's funny. Why so do you think I they did that? Yeah, I, it was baked in that, you know, my birthday is is the end of the month. And so okay. when she tried to teach me that there were 31 days, it, it meant that I had to betray my mom and I just wouldn't do it. So I was... <laughs> oh. I was I was on like a Kanye West level of denial. Oh God! And like just um, like we can talk about that if you want. We will. We'll we'll, we'll get we'll get in that for sure. Um, I I like that you doodled a lot. Now I doodle. Do I still do? I I have sketchbooks all over my house. Yeah. So. Okay. So that's different. I stopped doodling, and I think it's like I feel like I was doodling because I was using it as maybe a defense mechanism either against loneliness or against like someone coming over and and doing something I didn't like. Why were you doodling? Oh, I wish I had a deep psychological explanation for it. Honestly, it's just that 
I have a short attention span. I still do. I work really hard on it. As I've gotten older, I'm better about it. Um, but you know, it's, and it's never that I'm not listening. I've always been just a super capable multitasker. Um, you mentioned Nolan at Gravitas Ventures, yeah. my CEO. I mean, even he had to ask me at one point to stop doodling during meetings. Um, <laughs> and like I said, it's not because I'm not paying attention and absorbing everything you say. I just have a really hard time sitting still ever, always. And the pandemic certainly made that worse. I'm scratching my ear like I can reach it. Um, <laughs> um, the pandemic made it so much worse, right? Because all we could do was sit still. So that's actually one of the reasons I now have sketchbooks all over the house. I bought a couple new ones when I was just sitting here quarantined and I started drawing a lot more. So um, it's just a really good, also like it keeps me from picking this thing up all day and so just zoning hard, yeah. out on the television. It gives me something a little more um, brain active to do. Yeah. I would love to see some of your sketches. Uh, uh, I will, I will email you some if you want. I don't mind. I'm not going to get up and get them now because yeah. I don't want you, I don't want to interrupt, but yeah, I'll send you some. Yeah, I don't send mind. Me some. They're I around will. here somewhere. I absolutely love that. We have so many guests on this podcast that are like, above average are great at a variety of things. And it's not surprising at all that, that if you're great at one thing, you're, you're great at something else. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, was there a moment though, that you knew you wanted to live a life in public relations and live the public relations life and career path? No, oh, that hasn't happened yet. Oh, really? <laughs> Okay. No, I'm, kid I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, but I will I, say like at least three times a week, I'm like, why did I choose this profession? I have no idea. No. Well, what I know happened you studied screenwriting. I did. Yeah. So I went to Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. I was a major in screenwriting. Um, and I still, I have always loved writing. Um, I, I used to write, I used to have one of those black and white composition books in elementary school and I would mm -hmm. write novels like about my friends. Um, so I've always loved writing in high school. Like I mentioned, my English teacher, Mr. Perry, I really, really started to love writing. I went to the University of Arizona first. I was a musical theater major my freshman year. I burned out on that real quick. And um, a professor I had my sophomore year. If I, if I can just top in right here, AJ, oh, yeah. why, why did you burn out on that? I started performing when I was seven. Um, and it just... By the time I was 18, 19, I was just exhausted. Um, I also had a really hard time handling the judgment that comes along with that. Like you're mm. on stage and you're being judged and evaluated and being told you're too fat or too thin or too loud or, you know, you're not singing high enough. You're not singing low enough. And I just, mm. it was exhausting. I couldn't take it anymore. And I couldn't get myself to take on that life forever. Yeah. Um, so that's why, uh, I had a professor, my sophomore year, Dr. Bernardi, who I'm also still friends with, by the way, no. um, took an interest in my writing and my, I had a, I started to become like an early adopter on the internet, right? I was building websites on GeoCities. If you remember, yeah, I remember GeoCities. Those. Wow. Yeah. Um, I was shout out to Kevin Rose. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, very good. Um, I was, you know, I was making websites when nobody was. I was looking for excuses to do it. I was learning how to build my own computers. Um, and I was writing a lot. Um, I would like fold it into whatever projects I had in the class. It was a media arts class. So anytime I could use it as an excuse to write something. And so he told me about this program at NYU for screenwriting. And we knew it was a long shot. They let in 11 to 20 kids per year, and usually only a couple transfers. Somehow I made it in there on some writing samples I sent them, which was wonderful. Um, but yeah, how, sorry, I'm, all this is to say uh, I graduated. 9-11 happened pretty much the second I graduated. Oh, got it. Um, a month after 9-11, I put my tail down between my legs and moved back to Los Angeles. I worked um, some random jobs. I worked retail. I worked at a law firm. Um, getting work as a writer, I'm sure everyone can 
has heard is it's pretty hard. To, it's a pretty tough way to earn a living. It's a pretty hard nut to crack into. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew I didn't want to live in my parents' house forever. Uh, like I said, I'm not good at sitting still. I wanted to move forward. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I started to look at graduates graduate school programs because I wasn't getting into any doors. I certainly wasn't getting any job offers with a screenwriting degree, which is a shame because I think it says a lot about certain skills. And I found this program at USC in uh, master's in communications. I could go to school at night and still work during the day, which is something I felt like I needed to do because I didn't want to stop earning money. And I didn't really know what I wanted to major in. I picked communications because it was broad uh, right. and because it seemed like a way to be creative, but still earn a living. Mm-hmm. So the very first class I took was called Entertainment and the Internet, <sighs> which was in 2006, a way to explain social media because right. no one was using that term right. yet quite yet. And I had the, it was a co-taught class by these two guys named Josh Mooney and Judson Ferdin. And, um, it was an exploration in what would become social media. I, I loved it. I loved it so much. It appealed to the creative side of me. It, it appealed to the person in me that likes to sit down and teach herself HTML and write, make websites just for fun. Um, it just like thrilled me. I thought it was so cool. And so that was kind of the jumping off point. And from there, I took like a class called image man- management. I took communications ethics and I just got like full force. Like I just went full throttle into it. And I wrote my graduate thesis on, this is about two and a half years later, on how social media, by then we were saying that term, how social media was going to revolutionize and completely change the entertainment industry. And a lot of people were like, oh, no, it's a fad. And I, I'd like to think that I am the person who changed it all. I am completely, yeah. I'm the person who changed the entertainment industry. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, that's my my 44-page thesis was a mini opus on that. And from there, you know, I just, I had a really good stroke of luck when this woman came and spoke at an alumni event. And said she was hiring an assistant and I was the type of nerd who kept her resume in her backpack. And, you know, about four days later, she hired me to be her assistant in the PR department at Hallmark Channel. And that's it. I was off and running. So oh. that is how I became a publicist. Sorry for the long rant. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. There's a lot to dig into there. Do you think that your 2008 thesis has come to pass? Fast oh, forward yeah. and looking at retrospect, like what were there... What was sort of the most controversial or questionable thing in that thesis that you remember that has actually come to pass today? One thing I did was um, I had a lot of friends who worked in like production or post-production. I mean, it's LA, right? So um, I was connected to one of the producers of the show Big Brother because they were one of the first shows to involve the audience in a sense like you could go online and watch the house guests you could go online and vote for certain things pertaining to the house guests like rewards or punishments so I interviewed this guy I think his name was Rich and yeah I mean basically what we were discussing we were hypothesizing that having a second screen was going to become commonplace Mm. in entertainment right um, that was controversial because most people were of the opinion that no one could concentrate on television and this at the same time, right? And yeah. and what has happened since, I'm sure you know, and a lot of people listening know, is that it's completely commonplace. We We watch content on our devices. We watch television and we Google things that are of interest to us. We watch Talking Dead on AMC and we tweet along with it. You know what I mean? So what was controversial, I don't know if controversial is the right word. No one was angry about it or upset about it, but there was definitely some disagreement or cynicism around it. And now it turns out that's pretty much what everyone does in mainstream culture. Um, And even, even like not necessarily as like a 
technical second screen, but like the internet is basically integrated into our lives, right? It's not even a second screen. It's more like a first screen. So yeah, there, you know, there's, um, I guess I had some foresight. Who knew? You, you certainly did. It reminds me of the stories around the the coming of television and mm-hmm. the move away from radio. And there yeah, were a lot of radio. critics of television when it came out because it was really bad at first. It was described in newspapers as prominent as the New York Times as right. this is TV is just really bad radio yep. with, with images. It's just really bad radio. And those people couldn't see what you saw, which is that what happens when TV gets gets really good, it'll probably cannibalize and kill radio. And I'm and the modern day buggles. There you go. Video killed <laughs> and, the, that, those and, are the people who sing Video Killed the Radio Star, for those of you at home who are too young to know that. Oh, boy, they're going to have to Google that one, AJ. But <laughs> I'm, I'm, second but screen. I'm, I'm with you. And I, I really credit the American Idol's really American Idol because voice wasn't out yet. There, those shows, it was really American Idol that they really pushed you to, along with maybe the app store with Apple, those yeah. two things happening and dovetailing were huge for us having that integration of our phones or devices along right. with TV. And I think yeah. eventually it'll just overtake TV, but I agree. But this idea of you're going to vote on a singer from your mm-hmm. phone whilst watching the show. Absolutely. So now Absolutely. you're engaged. Now you are, it's sticky. Like you can't not watch right. the show because you're doing something physically. Right. Or you're physically I, involved in the show in a way you've never been before. Right. I think people also like, you know, American Idol has been around for 800 years now. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that people forget because it's become kind of a, I don't want to say a joke, but you know, so it comes it's been secondary around, to the voice in America's got. Yeah, talent. I mean, it's yeah. been around long enough that people don't take it as seriously as they used to. But I'm sure there's a lot of young people who don't even realize that's where Kelly Clarkson came from. That's where Jennifer Hudson came from. Simon Cowell is still very much on television. Yeah, um, he's much nicer now, and I'm sure a lot of people don't remember what an asshole he was. Oh, he was honest. Um, yeah, he'll, he'll he was give a it to famous you. asshole. He was, yeah. and, and go YouTube it because it's actually kind of priceless. But yeah. anyway, I think people devalue how how much American Idol moved us forward, yes. right? And then like not so long after that, there were networks like Bravo who were taking advantage of second screen opportunities. Like you could watch Top Chef and go online to see extra footage. So Bravo was one of the first cable networks to do that. So yeah, I mean, I think that shows like American Idol, um, Big Brother, Dancing with the Stars, they they got you to watch television and simultaneously participate in another activity. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, it, it's not like it was a long time ago, but it's long ago I mean, enough look, the, to, the people to, for people who, to forget that it was a phenomenon when it came, like there wasn't a show like it on TV. Right. Well, look, there's, we're now 2022, um, 18 year olds now were born in 2004. Like I said, oh, I'm no. not the math mathematician in my oh, family. No, AJ. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, <laughs> no, you're right. I just like, it's oh, scary God. to think about it. Yeah. Um, but I'm just saying like those kids were two, three, four years old when this was all starting. So they've, they're the first generation to live in a time where that didn't like where that is, th- that was the only choice, right? Like you and I still remember when there was dial up. Right? Like, yeah. Just not, yeah, like, yeah. imagine, I mean, basically I mean, example, I was 18, imagine someone I'm with not, a vote that I was 22 when 9-11 that. happened. Right. Yeah, so I'm just right. telling everyone how old I am now, but that's <laughs> I, I've been not ashamed. Um, yeah. So you like, there's, there's, thank you. <laughs> it's my mother. You have Good nothing genes. to worry about. Um, yeah. So anyway, like, look, there's a whole generation of kids now who have never had a phone in their house. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. There's a whole generation of kids who don't know that we used to only have, you know, 12 channels to watch and had to sit through commercials, right? right. So yeah. it's well, just- they're, they're, getting, they're getting that now with uh, what sponsored. I call the rebundling, the debundling before the rebundling with the, Hulu. The and AVOD version. The, of, the AVOD, yeah. yes. And the fast yeah. TV. Yeah. Oh, they're going to they're get these ads, AJ. Trust oh, me. That's I mean, not- even Netflix <laughs> is caving into it, right? So- Yeah, they kind of yeah. have to because- um, you know, they're in the position Apple was in in about 2011 or 12, where 
they realized that the work of these developers should not be given away for free. So they started, yeah. they started giving the apps away for free. So people would adopt the habit of downloading apps. Yeah. And then they realized, well, wait a second, these apps should not everything should be free. This is crazy. So right? I mean, how do you look, tell someone who's been getting milk for free that the milk costs now? Yeah. I mean, what, uh, why buy the cow when you can have the milk for free? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's interesting, right? Like look what's happening with a lot of the big companies, Netflix, Warner brothers. Um, they are just, they're trimming the fat, like big time yeah. and yeah. not to sound arrogant, but if anyone, anyone who knows me either just professionally or socially, I've been shouting for years that the way these guys have been doing business was not sustainable long-term. Um, yeah. I, and it seemed fairly obvious to me and probably to a lot of other people. So it begs the question, how did these CEOs not realize that? Like Netflix, there's not an infinite number of subscribers in the world, right? Like eventually you're going to hit your cap. Uh, it's, you know, how did they expect to be able to keep doing what they were doing on such a large scale? So it doesn't surprise me at all that they're caving, you know? You've got guys like Amazon and Apple who also have other businesses, other revenue mm. streams, but Netflix can't compete with that uh, financially, right? So anyway, we're completely not talking about PR, by the way. Did you notice no, this that? Is, this is fun. <laughs> this is what we do on the Make It Podcast. Okay. And uh, I'm interested to see how Netflix approaches the theater space. I think that's a yeah. win for them. And yeah. that could be a rev stream that they could bring back and, and make relevant in a lot of different ways. Yeah, it's interesting the way um, theatrical distribution has changed, even in as recently as the last, well, probably because of the pandemic, the pandemic right? Yeah. Which is a really big thing for my career because I primarily do PR for independent films. I have some other clients as well, but my my bread and butter for the last several years has been independent films, right? And there's a few ways to book a theater when you're an independent film. Um, or not book a theater. You can go direct to on demand, direct to yeah, iTunes, you can direct. It. You can do direct yeah. exactly. So you can do what's called a day and date model. You can come out on demand and in the theater at the same time. You can do a pre theatrical, which means your film comes out a little bit before the VOD. Usually, what a lot of independent films do is what you just said. They four wall, which basically means you rent four walls of a theater. So basically, you pay the theater to have your movie run for X amount of days and you get all the money. Whereas the, the opposite of that is the theater takes your film in a more natural organic way, which is what happens with most commercial films. And there's kind of like a rev share situation, but independent films don't make as much money as the Avengers. Right. So they have to four wall a lot of the time. Yeah. And it, it's an interesting thing a... to PR. I think theatrical releases are going to, it's going to be really interesting. I think the movie theaters are going to have to make their film going experiences more experiential. Um, I think they have to find more creative ways to get people into the building. Maybe they need to start showing films from olden times, right? Yeah, that um, yeah. someone my age didn't get to see on a big screen and make it an evening out. I don't, I don't, I don't really know what the solution is, but like you said, with, with Netflix, who actually owns a physical theater now in Hollywood. Yeah, in Hollywood. Um, they do all their screenings, award season yeah. screenings there. Yeah. And the other thing the the layman may not know is if you want to win an award, uh, particularly the Academy Awards, for example, you have to show your movie in a theater for at least seven days. So when you're Netflix, for example, and all of your movies are available on Netflix, um, when you own a theater, it's certainly a lot easier to just show a film for seven days and thereby making it, um, you know, eligible for an Academy Award nomination. Because if it was only on Netflix, it's not, right? Although those rules changed a little to accommodate the pandemic. But I think now it's back to that. It's a really, it has to show for seven days. That's a wonderful point to, to bring up. So, so Yeah, thank and you. until the Academy... Yeah abandoned ship on that, we will at least still be able to see our commercial award style films in theaters. Right. And, and you're certainly never going to see like an Avengers movie direct to VOD. Although I say that, and now I think about what came out during the pandemic that went right to VOD, but anyway. maybe, uh, in, Invisible Man, the Elizabeth Moss version of that, oh. went straight to VOD and was excellent. 
Yeah. Um, there um, were a few bets by Sony, I think, at the beginning of the pandemic that went straight in and they were like, let's just give this a yeah. shot. You know, what's an interesting example? Um, the Scarlett I Johansson went Marvel movie, I think, went straight there. Which one? The Scarlett Johansson oh, Marvel um, Black movie. Oh, Widow. Think, yeah, because yeah, there was Widow a lawsuit there. about that. Mm-hmm. Um, Which she sued them for that. But You know yeah. what? Rightfully so. And one, Honestly, yeah. rightfully so. She had a deal where she made money off box office and they took it out of the box office. Yep. Um, rightfully so. And And if she had been Robert Downey Jr., by the way, that probably wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. in my opinion but like for example a few a couple months ago i went to the el capitan theater in hollywood and i saw encanto uh because i love it and i had never seen it on a big screen because it was a pandemic movie i only saw it on disney plus Mm -hmm. and that was really cool the theater was full like children parents brought their children they wanted to see it on a big screen um so you know that's that's a good example of what i was saying is put a movie no one's seen on a big screen on a big screen and at the l cap you get you know you pay 21 dollars, and it includes a souvenir popcorn bucket and a thermos and you know whatever so like there's an incentive yeah i think that's great like i think it, every theater has to find a way to serve cocktails and dinner right i mean r.i.p arc light which used to be a movie theater in la yeah. that did just yeah. that but that's right um yeah, I also think there's some merit to like adult only theaters. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of date nights would happen in those yeah. scenarios. There's a theater talking, in Los you Angeles. You talking NC17 here, AJ? What are you What are you talking about? <laughs> no, but like for example, there's a theater in West LA called IPIC. I don't yeah. know if you're familiar, but like you walk in there, there's a restaurant, there's a bar. It's not a particularly large theater, which is probably smart. But like I went and saw. Um, the original Superman with Christopher Reeve. Yeah. He did in this. That's who I'm named cushy. after. What? That's who I'm named after. No kidding. That's yeah. awesome. My mom what thought cool he was sexy, thing. apparently. And I mean, she's not wrong. No. Um, whew. Uh, <laughs> that movie holds up, by the way. Like, yeah. think about that. This guy was flying through the air on wires in 1977. There was mm-hmm. no, was it 77? There was no CGI to like erase the. You know what I mean? Like it still holds up. It's still very magical. But anyway, we're sitting in a theater in these comfy leather chairs. They serve you. They give you a menu. You can order food. You can order cocktails. The theater only holds maybe 50 people, might be less. Like I said, it's a small building, but that theater was full. Yeah. And if you're, you're talking about real estate, they did a smart thing, right? They created just a very small theater as very experiential is not likely to bring children in, but is likely because of location and style is likely to bring in a affluent consumer. Yeah. So maybe that's the solution. Maybe IPIC has figured it out. Yeah. There's a lot of cool ways forward, depending on the acquisition model, like whether it be like Netflix and Apple get into theaters and or Amazon. Yeah. You can imagine a million different ways they they'd spin yeah. that. Um, but if, theaters stay the way they've been. You can imagine a lot of different ways they spin that as, as well. Um, yeah. Let's talk about this. I Kanye West here. Cause here's the thing. I don't want to have the conversation everyone's had ad nauseum. What I've noticed is so a, I didn't want to be the kind of person who made an opinion based on things I saw on Twitter. Cause I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a pro Twitter user. <laughs> Uh, just a heavy on Twitter. And I didn't, so I wanted to watch all the interviews and I know I've noticed, and this is kind of the angle I want to take on it. Cause I don't think anyone's spoken about this yet. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that each interview gets slightly better for him and slightly more apologetic. And I'm in, in the Lex you Freeman think? interview that he just did, which was, two hours long and Lex Friedman is a Ukrainian Jewish uh, MIT scholar and engineer. I didn't know about this. This Yeah. You got to see the Lex Friedman interview. That interview was normal. He didn't take any shit from Kanye or anything or yay or whatever. And by the way, yay wasn't combative. I was really like, okay, that's the Kanye West, I grew up listening to and understanding. So I am wondering. What does that tell you about him, though? Does that tell you that he knows what he's doing? Yeah. And I was going to say, maybe 
does his publicist know what he or she is doing? He doesn't are you, have one. Are, are you seeing, is this progression based on him hiring people well, to help him soften this and walk this back? Are you, is that why the interviews are getting better as they get further along? Not in my opinion. And just a couple of things to disclose. One, yeah, please. I have indirectly worked with him. Um, I was working at AEG Live when he mm -hmm. did the Yeezus tour. Mm -hmm. So I have not intimate knowledge. I've never shaken hands with the guy, thankfully. But, you know, I overheard some things, right? And I haven't signed any NDAs. However, I'm also a classy person. So please don't think I'm about to tell you anything salacious or private. It's not going to happen. Yeah, and the other I, would, thing I should, wouldn't want you to do that. No, so of course. Right. And the other, you're a classy guy. The other thing I should disclose is that I'm Jewish, mm -hmm. right? I have been, I actually, I literally just saw my therapist yesterday because I have been carrying around so much rage. In fact, from where I'm sitting, I can see the pile of Adidas stuff on the floor that I'm going to put in a dumpster. And I was in Adidas fan. I am a fan girl. Um, not anymore, but anyway, um, see, so you can see I'm like tensing up. <laughs> Here's the thing about Kanye, in my opinion, based on what I know about him and his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. First of all, to the best of my knowledge, he does not have a publicist. He doesn't think that he needs one. <clears throat> oh, he the best, needs one. He does, he needs but a bunch who's of people. the Who's the brave fucking publicist that's going to be like, I want to represent Kanye because I sure as shit don't. Right. Um, he, uh, he, he thinks he knows. And look, here's the thing. Maybe this is controversial. I think he's a smart guy. I, I think he knows exactly what he's doing and doesn't give a shit about it. Um, right. I think that he makes choices, right? And, and, a lot of people are quick to say he's suffering from a mental illness, that he's bipolar. Um, I know a lot of people with mental illnesses. I know quite a few people who are bipolar. Um, I don't really agree that we should chalk it up to that. I think it does a disservice to people who suffer from mental illness and do not come out into the world and say, I'm going to kill all the Jews, right? So I don't like that sentiment uh, very much, but... Um, and, and I also don't think it's true. I grew up in a household with a with my dad who worked at Middle Tennessee Mental Health Institute for 30 years. Right. And I've seen bipolar people. I've seen what crazy yeah. it looks like. He's not crazy. Right. No. And I, I hate that word crazy because who really knows what that means anymore? Yeah. Right. Well, he, he doesn't um, ha he, I, if he has anything, it truly is exhaustion and, and loneliness is what he's yeah, suffering. And he suffers I, from loneliness and and uh, exhaustion. I think he was extremely traumatized by the sudden death of his mother, whom he was very close to. I don't know if you saw the news about his his school, the Donda mm -hmm. Academy. School. He They sent out an email one day that I think it was just a couple of days ago. They're like, the school is closed. Never come in again. And then we might reopen. And then the next day they all got a letter that was like, we're reopening. Um, I don't know if that's him calling the shots, but mm -hmm. it sure seems like it, his MO. Yeah. Um, I think he also accidentally, intentionally, I don't know. I think he has surrounded himself with a team of yes people. And what I mean is he bankrolls a lot of people's lifestyles. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of people who should be saying, hey man, like, let's think about this. I think those people instead are afraid to sacrifice the lifestyle they're accustomed to living and say, whatever you want, Kanye, go for it. Or uh, also possible, they they just can't control him, right. right? I don't believe he has a personal publicist. I'm sure his record label has a PR team, but what can they really do? He's not out there promoting a record. He's promoting his own opinions. So that's what I think of him. Um, I, I have been in arguments in the last week with people online who are not Jewish, who are Jewish, who are other marginalized community members, um, opinions are like assholes and everybody's got one right um you know the other day i haven't really discussed this so you guys are getting like a mini, mini exclusive on my life love it on monday i was at a walgreens and uh, i had my dog with me i was going to pick up a prescription I, I can walk there it's right down the street and um i live in a, a part of the valley now that is very overrun with homeless people mm -hmm. so i never know who i'm going to encounter when i'm out there so i'm very alert very cognizant. Um, a couple of years ago, I was actually assaulted by a homeless person. So I'm very hypervigilant. And my dog and I wow. were 
walking through Walgreens and a black gentleman um, looked at me and said, are you Jewish? And I was immediately like frozen because I'm in my neighborhood and I'm like, who is this person? Yeah. But I said, yes, I am. Too. Yeah. I said, yeah, I am. Like, I don't know what about me screams Jewish, but okay. I said, yeah, I'm not ashamed of it. And, and my first instinct is to say, yes, I am. And he caught some stuff up in his throat and he spit on me. Oh my God. And, um, you know, I only mentioned he's black because He's from a, a different marginalized community than I am. It's a shame that he doesn't have more sympathy or empathy. Um, he may be a Kanye West fan, um, and and that's what inspired him to do that. He may have been a homeless guy. I don't know. He may have been someone who just was walking around that day looking for Jews. I have no idea. But, um, God, I don't even remember how we started this conversation because now I'm like sweating. But well, that's a crazy situation to, to yeah. To so be I got in. spit on because I'm Jewish, and and here's the regardless thing: regardless of who you are, though, I'm saying regardless of being Jewish or him being black, like yeah, we have to have more civility with one another as as human yeah. beings. Like who well, spits saw, on somebody? I saw Deborah Messing tweet something along the lines of, "There are 15 million Jews in the world." Kanye West has almost 19 million followers, right? And right. I'm not saying all of them listen to what he says, but mm -hmm. that's that's his reach, right? Yeah. So if people think it's silly to be... I would say it's bigger than that. Yeah, I mean, if, if people think it's silly or trivial or dumb to be afraid of these things that he is saying out loud, it's not. Like, I got spit on, is my yeah. point. Like, he has influence. This is... This is a really terrible case study of PR and how PR can work, yeah. right? He's out there saying things. He's convincing people of things that are not so, and I get spit on or a lot worse happens, right? Yeah. Um, and so when you get companies like The Real Real, who's a, it's a designer resale platform, who's no mm. longer taking and reselling um, Kanye products, um, yeah. you know, you get, uh, Skechers escorting him out of the building. You get finally Adidas dropping him. Um, that's, that's important. That is really important stuff. That is, that is people saying like, this is not okay. And we don't agree with it. Yeah. And you shouldn't either. Right. That's yeah. the PR. That's, that's the strategy. I have no idea why it took Adidas that long. I would have been on it with some kind of statement immediately. Um, shame on them. Um, yeah, that, but, that was, that was money. You know, he's, he's responsible for nearly 70% of their online sales. Their stock dropped by half when they I think when it, you so. sign on to work with Kanye, you, you got to know what you're signing on to. Um, yeah. tough shit at the, at the end of the day, yeah. there's it's not some, an excuse, but I think that's the reason why. No, it oh, absolutely. So yeah. and, and I had a fight this morning with someone on LinkedIn who was saying at the end of the day, business is business and they got to make money. Okay, fine. But we're also human beings. Very cynical. View I'm also, like I said, there's a pile of Adidas shit on my floor right now. It includes four pair of shoes, a sweatshirt, a lanyard, a hat, gloves. Like, I'm not exaggerating. I'm an, I was an Adidas fangirl. I'm a consumer. So you want to talk about Kanye costing you money now? What about all the millions of people who are no longer going to buy your products for a decade? Right, where they vote with their with their wallet based vote on with their, I mean their stock dropped, right? Yeah. Their stock plummeted yeah, and a day later they were disavowing him. So yeah. yeah, that's that's where you hit them with their wallets. Yeah, it's it's I would I would say to everybody, watch the Lex Freeman podcast. I'm gonna check that out. Uh interview where where he apologizes for what he's done a lot. And the and to your point. The question is, is he apologizing now that he's lost $400 million well, in brand right? licensing deals? Or is he apologizing because he realizes how absolutely delusional and and right. and, and sort of this, uh, he has delusions of grandeur that are on a level that uh, that it's you dangerous. don't see normally, but that are dangerous. So maybe he's realized that. So the question is, and two things can be true. Maybe he's lost a lot of money and then realized also... Yeah, the poor this billionaire. Not He's go, now this, only worth four hundred million. This, this did not go the way I thought it was going to go because I I have heard what you were talking about where he thought that so there is this rumor that he wanted to get out of the Adidas deal and thought oh. that he could say something that would get him dropped so he could go 
I mean, and, he basically and do a deal with somebody else that was worth more, that was a better deal for him. Um, right. But this went completely haywire on him. Um, I mentioned Lex's podcast as well because of just the power of podcasting sort of in the, I think we're getting a great example in the last month of the power of podcasting in the overall PR space. And yeah, in the I mean, every client space. I have now, every client I have now, before they ask for anything else, they ask me to get them on podcasts. It's a yeah, really it's, big deal. It's I, I look at the mix maker situation where she had the film, the documentary Jihad Rehab, which is now mm-hmm. named Unredacted. Mm-hmm. And we had first spoke about her. We were the first podcast to speak positively about her uh, on the record. I had the bravery to do it because Sundance and South by Southwest had done an about face. They loved the movie. Then they turned around once they got pressure from people in the Middle East saying yeah. that a white woman shouldn't have made this movie and all these other things. Yeah. Um, they, That's hard. They, they, yeah. they said they hated the movie and like, yeah. and, and didn't program it. And then her own investor, Abby Disney, who's super influential, said the movie was trash, even though she invested yeah. in it, was first money in. And and so Meg was broke. She had no money. She yeah. didn't pay her investors back. Her life is ruined. Her name is besmirched. She goes on the Waking Up podcast or the Making Sense podcast with Sam Harris. And her GoFundMe goes from $3,000 to now last time I checked, $650,000. It's yeah. probably more now. That is tremendous outcome from being on a podcast and doing one interview. Right. And and think about this. And YouTube has kind of the same power. It's evergreen. That content mm-hmm. will be available in perpetuity. It's also why the video on demand model works, right? Like you will be making money off that for a very long time. It will be out there for a very long time. And this is something I tell my filmmaker clients, by the way, um, maybe you'll only get four editorial pieces co- published about your film, but they are out there on the internet. They never go away. You mm-hmm. never know when someone's going to see it. You never know when someone's going to be scrolling through their iTunes menu and remember, oh, I saw that thing about that movie last year and the movie's now available. That podcast will always be there. That GoFundMe, I don't know how long that'll be there. Um, you know, a, another example is a lot of these, um, a lot of organizations did fundraisers on YouTube during the pandemic. Like you could watch some kind of cast reunion and on the side, there would be like a panel to donate. Those yeah. donation panels are still up. So if I go and watch the cast reunion of ER on YouTube, mm-hmm. I can still donate to the whatever charity it was that they were encouraging. Um, yeah, it's a great so, point about the power of YouTube as yeah. well. Like, yeah, I'm working on a documentary right now about the power of YouTube. So I'm I'm fairly laser focused on that. We got to talk about that off off offline. It we. I, well, I should say I at least once a month check YouTube to see who is pirating one of our movies. <laughs> and I've talked about this all the, like a few times on the podcast. Well, sometimes it's it's something really sweet happens. And that's what happened the last time I checked. So this was very recently. I checked to see if our film, Another Version of You, is being pirated. And sure enough, <clears throat> on YouTube, there's a video. And this guy's YouTube channel, which has over 300,000 subscribers, his YouTube channel is just a channel where he eloquently speaks about a film. So that's his thing. And it's, and it's, I think it's in France. Okay. So I didn't understand a word he was saying, but for some reason in his tone, I could tell he was saying something good about the movie. That's amazing. And And so then I read the comments and the comments were like, where can I see this movie? Where can I find this movie? This sounds awesome. You know, like, yeah. And it had been watched 22,000 times and it had just been released like a day or so ago. Yeah. So all of a sudden our movie that came out in 2018 got 22,000 free views of publicity with someone saying something nice about it and people right. in the comments asking where they can buy it. So I hit up the producing team and said, Hey, let's all work together and drop where to buy, where to watch links in the comments as replies on this video. And we did I that. I would also put the movie on sale. Yeah. Well, it's on sale. You can buy it like on iTunes and, and, and DVD and Blu-ray. Sure. So we've dropped those links in the comments. That's the power of YouTube. And and there's going to be somebody else in 
you know, Poland that watches it for the first yeah. time and decides to do the same video benefiting him or herself, but then yeah, as a proxy benefiting the film they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's in my, in my space, we, we kind of see the same thing happen with Rotten Tomatoes, which drives me absolutely crazy. Tell by me the way. about but, that. What is, what do you see with Rotten so Tomatoes? So you get a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Everyone's like, what is this movie? It's a really big deal. It holds a yeah. lot of power. Um, do you want me to talk about Rotten Tomatoes? Because I can go off about yeah, Rotten Tomatoes. Give me, give me a little bit about Rotten Tomatoes because I don't know how they beat Metacritic. That's a, Metacritic that's a, seems like such a better a idea. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Metacritic also, like they've, I don't know if anyone's checked them out lately. They've been amping up their editorial content, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, look, uh, I don't know exactly what your demographic is, but basically um, just to give people a little insight, you know. Mostly filmmakers. English right. So everyone knows Rotten Tomatoes mm -hmm. um, puts a score up about your film. There's two scores that the critic score and the audience score. The one most people care about is the critic score, which mm -hmm. I think should be the other way around. But anyway, the critic score, when you're a big commercial, successful giant movie like the Avengers, you need a couple hundred reviews to get. Um, so like basically, look, you get one or two reviews, no Rotten Tomatoes score. You get hundreds of them. You start to accumulate that Rotten Tomatoes score. Mm -hmm. When you're an independent film, thankfully, you only need five Rotten Tomatoes approved critics to review your film to start getting that score. That score is important because a lot of the on-demand and streaming platforms now put that score right on the menu page for your film. Mm -hmm. So it's become overwhelmingly important and it sucks, but it can, it can make your film. It can also break your film. Yeah. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter at all. I think Black Adam has like a 48% and it had a huge opening box office. Um, it, did. It, it did 67 million, but it wanted to, to they wanted double. They wanted Tom yeah. Cruise Maverick numbers. Right. They wanted like 135 opening right. weekend, well, but they and, still and, were number one by a mile. Right. And I don't know what Maverick's Rotten Tomatoes score is, but it's, it's pretty up there. Right. Yeah. yeah so maybe it, it does, movie. maybe it does make a difference. It is it's so good. Um, anyway, it, it's, it's interesting, right? And like the, the controversy of the last few years for Rotten Tomatoes is that the critics that are RT certified are not particularly diverse. So we're mm -hmm. pitching 400 of the same person. And so what they have made a point of doing, much like the Academy and, and the Golden Globes and whomever else, is embracing more diverse critics, which is all well and good. But here's the problem for publicists like me. I get a film that is directed by a Korean man starring a Chinese woman and a Hispanic or Latino co-star. And I am pitching critics to review it and they're not biting. Mm. They're, they're too busy reviewing Captain America. And don't get me wrong. I love Chris Evans, but you can't be out there talking about diversity and the need for diversity and not review some of these movies, especially when you are the Asian critic or the female critic or the LGBTQ plus critic, right? Yeah. When I go to those people and ask them to support their own community, they are saying, I would love to, but I only make money if I review Marvel movies, right? Mm. And I get that. Everyone has to pay their bills. And I think what this is all indicative of is that it is a systemic issue i don't know how you fix it but it is a big problem and it's yeah. a shame also because like the filmmakers i represent they're making some really good movies like really good movies um and it's it's getting harder and harder to get them seen so i have a couple that is ideas the power of rotten tomatoes yeah it's a similar problem we faced and we had our we redeveloped our business model around branding and marketing for independent film and we've talked about this offline aj one of the reasons we did that was because of the same problem. Basically, an independent filmmaker can't go out and hire the very, very best marketing company mm -hmm. because that company can't allow themselves to take the type of discount it would require because then they couldn't charge that amount again to like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Apple, et cetera. Right. Or and by the way, just to shamelessly plug myself, that's why you come to me because I work with independent filmmakers and I keep my rates competitive. That's Thanks, right. Guys. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Well, I, that's 
listen, that's that's so meta right there. It's 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 the case. So maybe I'm maybe nothing we if can not a publicist this. for myself. Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe we can we can expand our model out to critics and then also make that part of that mix. But I think right. uh having someone like you uh to lean on as a filmmaker can maybe solve that problem without having to do all that stuff. Right. Um, well, and then, you know, the other thing, and I hate to, to put anyone out there, but there's, there's now, a, you've now got a handful of critics who want to review independent movies, but can't necessarily afford to, but if you pay pal them 50 bucks, they'll do it. Right. And Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. I, and, and frankly, you know what? Fuck it. Do pay, it. Pay I don't 50. care. Yeah. Pay, I don't I care. For 50, 50 bucks, right. For 50 bucks. I'll, I'll love, I'd love for you to review my film because I'm out there trying to act in the best interest of my client. I want as many people as possible to hear yeah. about this amazing movie that's not getting enough attention. Yeah. Now, granted, granted, I have a code of ethics that I have a really hard time stepping away from, but I totally get that. I do. I get it. Let them do it. But the, the converse, the other point is Rotten Tomatoes isn't out there policing it, which is a problem also. Right? So. Right. Yeah, like I, I said, love it's this a idea systemic of, issue. Of, I have no idea how you fix it. I love Man this Cold idea Black. of aiming towards the top of the mountain in the critic world and then offering to pay in Ethereum or Bitcoin because they're so variable. Oh, so okay. yeah, they could take an L on that, but also their $50 could turn into $550 right. on a whim. Right. And all of a sudden they were overpaid for um the work so that right. that's an interesting a, a approach too um I, I know that you're uh, a heavy twitter user just like me and yeah. i just saw where someone said hire you as your uh publicist you won't regret it and i, I like that tweet and made a oh. little comment on it so you have very sweet and dedicated clients and very now lucky. twitter yeah. is officially owned by elon musk is this a good thing, bad thing, um, in the middle? What, what do you, you think the what? pros and cons I, are going to be? I think it literally took effect today, right? Um, yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I know that the 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 whole platform, as much as I love Twitter, I know that it was a cesspool of negativity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if putting Elon Musk in charge of that is the solution. I don't know. Like, I just don't know. I don't like him. I think he's a dick. Um, <laughs> I can't. I can't dispute his accomplishments, though. I mean, look, no. Jack Dorsey, who invented Twitter and mm. Square and a bunch, of, he's kind of a dick, too, right? He's just a different kind. Um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, they're all jerks, right? They're all megalomaniacs. Um, I just, I, I personally think Elon Musk is a douchebag, so, but I don't, I don't know. I really, I don't know how it'll affect Twitter. I don't, I'm not prophetic enough to, to figure that one out. I don't think it could get worse. Um, I yeah, don't know it, how it's interesting. There's a, there's a great company called bot signal out of mm -hmm. the UK. I'm forgetting the guy's last name. His first name is Chris though. And he, and he basically developed software that would track bot activity, uh, that was negative towards a particular person. So oh, okay. one of his most famous reports was he found out that Kamala Harris gets abused on Twitter more than any person on Twitter. And most I mean, I of wish people I could say that real. surprised me. So mm -hmm. these Russian and Chinese bots will go in and, and call her the B word, call her a bitch, you know, call her the N word, all this stuff. And they're not even real people. Yeah. And so anytime she posts anything, there's a bot army that comes and mm -hmm. like denigrates her so that, the first thing a real person sees when they go to her tweet is everyone sure. hating her. Sure. And if he cleans that up, that would be great. That Look, I'm is all, all he has to do. Cause I don't have to, I don't have to know him. I'm a big, I, I was in the Michael Jackson fan club. I don't want to hang out with him, but his music was fire. Right. right. I and, mean, look, and, Tom, and Tom Cruise fire. is a great example. He's a Scientologist, which is something that I, I have read a lot of books about and definitely can't <laughs> stand and have zero patience for, but like, the dude makes amazing movies and he's not yeah. physically hurting anybody. So I guess it's fine. Yeah, um, he's the last I don't know if I'll ever be able to watch the usual suspects ever again, but I can tolerate Maverick. Um, I don't know. Look, yeah. If he can clean up bots, if he can make it a, a tidier place to exist, I'm all for it. Um, yeah. 
that would be great. He he definitely held Twitter accountable throughout the acquisition process, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the same thing that's happening with the LA mayoral race. Actually, you've got Karen Bass, who, and yeah. you know, again, disclosure: I'm a Democrat. Um, no one is surprised. Uh, <laughs> you've got Karen Bass running, and she's she's definitely, you know, she's she's portraying herself as a little more like empathetic and and a caretaker and she's yeah. here to like fix everybody and take care of LA and I'm all for her by the way I'm very pro bass but like on the flip side of that you've got Rick Caruso who is also a democrat mm-hmm. and you know he's coming in with tough love he's like let's clean this shit up like I am here to kick some ass and while I don't particularly support him I get it like I get why people are into that. Um, yeah. It's a little scary because also that's kind of like the platform Donald Trump ran on, but yeah. I get it. I do get it. Like, especially in LA, it's, it's become, there's become a lot of um, environmental, a... ecological, um, economical problems. And and he's coming in and saying like, he's doing what you're supposed to yeah. do to win people over. Right. He's, yeah. he's out there saying like, let's get this shit together. I've I got billions of dollars, so let's do it. I read a stat that blew my mind the other day, AJ, it said that 50% of the country's homeless live in the state of California. I can't say that surprises me between LA and San Francisco. I mean, I mean and pretty, if you want to go up the West Coast, that's Portland, pretty remarkable. Portland has a huge homeless issue, huge, because yeah. they have some tax incentives in their state that actually make it financially viable to be homeless. Yeah. <laughs> Like, it's like being, it's you like can being still a collect, corn soy I, farmer. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know exactly what it is, but I spent some time there and I remember noticing like, why are there so many homeless people in Portland? And apparently yeah. someone at my hotel told me, like, I don't know exactly what it is, but like you can still go to X place and collect X money when you're homeless in Oregon, whereas in some other states you can't. So whatever it was, but yeah, I think the anyway. same thing is, is in Washington state as well. Yeah, I mean, clearly uh, a lot it's just of the, the military. Whole West, yeah. Also, we have we have great weather. It's easier yeah. environmentally to be yeah. homeless here. Like, why wouldn't you? You know, if I was homeless, I'd probably stay in L.A. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a terrible conversation. Better, oh, my better, God. Better, well, it's better than Chicago. You know, yeah. like, like I've spent time oh, in, yeah. in Chicago and L.A. both a lot. And it's like I'd rather be homeless in L.A. I'm, I mean, I'm look, with you. It's same reason why a lot of at least elderly you have community citizens. In LA. Yeah. A lot of elderly citizens go down to Palm Springs and Florida. Florida, right yeah. like you know go get go get the good weather yeah that's what so. that's what you do that's what you do all right yeah. i, I want to pivot really quickly to uh some tactics some pr tactics if you don't sure. mind i'm Fair curious enough. if you have an example of crisis management on social media for one of your clients have you ever worked through or or, or how would you handle them if no. the crisis was actually on one of these networks no i mean to be honest with you no i don't I stay away from crisis communications. I have enough intelligence to know what my skill sets are and my boundaries are. Um, When I have encountered a crisis communications situation, I typically refer them to someone who is an expert in that space, like someone who solely deals with crisis communications. Um, That said, you know, um, yeah, I mean, you know, occasionally from time to time, I've been asked by a client like, should I say anything about X? And I will say either no or yes. And if it's yes, I'll help them craft something. Um, but generally speaking, it is a it is a finely tuned skill. Um, you've got people out there like, I think her name is Judy Davis, the woman who actually Carrie Washington is based on in Scandal. Like that's mm-hmm. all she does. Um, you've got people like, uh, there's a publicist who I'm friends with named Danny Duraney, really great with a crisis. Right. Um so, yeah, I mean, people like that. Um, I can't remember his name, Kevin something. You know, there's this guy named Kevin. He's actually the guy who brokered the deal uh, for Kim Kardashian's sex tape. Um, oh, wow. You can look him up. I forgot. I'll I get think his I know last his name. name. Yeah. Yeah. But like, he's a fixer, you know. So there's guys like, there's guys like that, publicists and non publicists floating around who handle that stuff way better than I ever could. Yeah. I'm just, you know, look, I'm a freelancer. I represent independent films. They're generally, not controversial. I think the the most crisis heavy thing is, is one of my very first clients as an independent film publicist freelance was 
the star of one of my movies got busted for drunk driving like mm. a month before a movie came out. And basically our our path of least resistance was to just not pitch him for interviews. Yep. That's that's smart. It's interesting to do? know too that there are a bunch of sort of nonviolent Ray Donovans out there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, can, Ray Donovan do. is made for TV and I'm sure there's people like that that exist, but there's plenty of people who don't function yeah. that way. Right. They yeah. don't have to get but, up I mean, and all bad. There's there's definitely publicists and you're not even in the crisis space, right? There's definitely publicists out there that are really bitchy <laughs> if if not just downright nasty and I get that too because if you represent like a top tier A-list client yeah. and I'm just arbitrarily picking someone, right? Like you, let's say you represent Ryan Reynolds mm -hmm. and I don't off the hand, top of my head, I don't know who represents him, but I do know that he comes off as a really cool, yeah. nice guy. And yeah. I'm pretty sure from what I've heard, he's like that in real life, right? But he's such a nice guy that he's going to like say yes to everything. So who does he want to represent him? The bad guy, mm -hmm. right? Like he wants like the nastiest publicist he can get to turn shit down so that he doesn't look like a dick. Because he doesn't right. want, do you know what I mean? So like, mm -hmm. I think there's a place for those kinds of publicists in certain spaces. You're probably not going to find a lot of bitchy people doing publicity for independent films that doesn't benefit the industry. But I do understand why those publicists have to exist. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I know TJ Miller had a, has a problem with Ryan Reynolds, but you can't be. You can't take TJ Miller the, seriously, the, can you? The dick in the room and then complain of somebody else being a dick to you. Uh, you know, they were like, I, I'm a big Ryan Reynolds fan. So I'm a little biased. Uh, sure. I know in who 2000, isn't? yeah, who isn't, he's the best at being himself. Um, that's a really, that's a really good, yes, he is. Yeah. I mean, he's just Ryan Reynolds in the movie and we love it. Yeah. I'm uh, here for it. Do it. <laughs> if he does nothing else. And I think he's kind of like, even more recently, he's kind of embraced that more and more and more. He's like, mm -hmm. look, if I'm just myself as Deadpool, or myself as, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. look, Tom Cruise has made a career out of being the same guy in a million movies. Yeah, that's a great point. He's not, yeah. he's not particularly diverse in his roles, but who cares? Like, he makes good movies. They're super fun, and he's, he's really a, good at he's running and star. blowing shit up. Maybe yeah. the last movie star. Not everyone has to be so. Will Smith, right? Like, he really wanted yeah. to go from Independence Day to making Oscar movies. We all saw how that turned out, but... Well, he won it, you know, but... <laughs> yeah fair point did he though did he um, yeah, and tom cruise about, has been nominated about, for tom cruise has been nominated fumbling the bag on that one wow yeah yeah tom oh, cruise man. has been nominated for an oscar so it's not totally without those moments yeah. but i'm just saying like yes anyway he's the best at being himself ryan reynolds back to that you were also ahead of the game back in 2006 when you had one of your uh companies that you worked for download myspace oh yeah MySpace, the original social media network i'm curious what yeah. you think fast forward to today well, actually i think friendster predated MySpace. oh yeah you're if right. you really want to get down to and, it but. and then friendster was predated by something else i can't remember the name well of it. i mean even in the in the days of like so like i started blogging name? in 2002 right but no one was calling it blogging it they was were calling just it like blogging 2.0 or something or it was just having a diary on the internet right it was like neil yeah. patrick harris and doogie hauser it was <laughs> i was just keeping a diary i was just keep like i mean who thought that was going to be the 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 foresight right yeah. um the forecast. I, I was keeping a diary on the internet that other people could read. I mean, literally the website was called diaryland.com. So there were those kinds of things and you could follow other diaries and people could follow you. There were networks like live journal yeah. that were yeah. happening, things like that. And then Friendster and then MySpace. And, and I was, you know, I was studying what I was studying in graduate school. I was working at Hallmark channels at the time. Yep. And I worked for the head of corporate communications yep. and she and family. I, sorry, crown media family Networks. crown media family networks at the time. It was just Hallmark channel. Um, but now they are so much bigger. Um, yep. and you know, me and my boss, her name was Nancy. Uh, we were talking and she was like, let's get on MySpace." And I was like, that's a terrific idea. My and so I actually, for me. I mean, I loved my space until it became not my space. Um, it, it, yeah, but I, I basically was asked, I'm not sure about the timeline of this, but at some point I was asked by the chief communications officer, a guy named Mark, to put together a PowerPoint presentation on the benefits of online social networking. Mm. He would call it OSN, 
Um, <laughs> and I still have that PowerPoint somewhere. I've looked Sounds like at a right wing news every, station. Yeah, I know, right? Like um <laughs> OSN. It really does. It's like a parlor, the early days of parlor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I put together this PowerPoint. We got ourselves in MySpace. Um, you know, it it grew over into um the consumer side of our publicity department putting like recipes and and fun things for people to share on our website and um not long after i left the company they got onto facebook and now they have like this ginormous social media following on all the platforms um so while i can't take full credit for all of that i do like to think that i helped give them a little shove yeah, into at your, at your social media at yourself yeah. on the back. I, I, it, it was a phenomenon for me because I realized how powerful it was. It was a concept I wasn't really, I didn't fully understand at the time until I had a really close friend back then who was um, a good person, but a deadbeat dad, right? Mm. And and couldn't couldn't really keep a job. And, That's a shame. You know, had you know, tough time. You know, in school, didn't go to college, and then. His MySpace page said, loving father, Oof. here's my income per year, college graduate. And it hit me that, oh, on social media, you can be whoever you aspire to be. I mean, can I get like super nerdy for a second? Please. Really, really good line from Star Trek. When Captain Picard says to Data, it is possible to make all the right decisions and still have a negative outcome. Mm. So you can go on MySpace and you can present yourself however the hell you want, but you could still be a shithead, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think about that quote a lot. <laughs> my favorite Star Trek quote is from my friend Joey Baggs, who is always having to debate Star Wars fans and his oh. as a Star Trek yeah, fan. Just like them both equally. Come I on, think nerds. So. I think that I'm fine with that. And, you know, yeah. he, he would always say Star Trek is for adults. <laughs> I mean, I actually kind of get that argument because George Lucas notoriously like incorporates entertainment for children into everything he yeah. does, right? Like that's yeah. why we got stuck with Jar Jar Binks. Yeah. So yeah. Duh. I do find that there's a lot of man children that love Star Wars. Um who are I mean, kind of I love Star Wars. Youth, you know, I love and that's Star fine. Wars. What's wrong with that? Yeah. Talk about loving things equally. I love Star yeah. Wars. If G.I. Joe no comes on, I'm watching it. Oh, so good. I have those. Voltron um, comes on, I'll watch it. Oh my God. I had all those action figures as a kid. Did I really, really did. <laughs> Do you remember the G.I. Joe, um, the twins? There were twin villains. Yeah, yeah. The Crimson Twins. Yes. I had those action figures and I used I to I love the them. Crimson Twins. I, would, I had Crimson Twin first, action figures. I had Cobra and, uh, Commander. I had all of them. I used to make them fight each other. I would who play. Who was the ninja, AJ? Like uh, Storm oh. Shadow? So, so sounds... Storm Shadow and the Crimson Twins were the first villains I ever rooted for. Yeah, yeah. Now it's commonplace, I mean, but I used to. Um, I grew up with these these kids. I'm still friends with their family friends, but me and my friends Mitchell and Mark, uh, we would disassemble Mitchell's family. Had like this giant sofa, and you could take all the cushions off, and we would build pillow forts, and we would <laughs> get his like Millennium Falcon, and we would play Star Wars. And because there were two boys and a girl, like. Yeah. One would be Han and one would be Luke and I would be Leia and we would come up with these scenarios. So yeah. Anyway, for kids. We had but. we had a great childhood. I, I talked to my dad about what they did as kids. It's like, what did you do guys do for fun? Oh, we grabbed BB guns and went to the woods and shot each other in the face. <laughs> like, oh shit was real back then. <laughs> I mean holy shit. Like let's yeah. emulate, let's emulate the war. Our dad I mean, we had laser tag in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Things have things so, have gotten much much better. Um, yeah. In your opinion, though, today, what is the best network? If you had to tell one of your clients, and they could only be on one social media network, where well, would you tell them to go? I don't think you can put that finite a point on it, right? What I actually usually tell clients is, where does your audience live, mm. and let's go be effective there, right? So if you've got a documentary and it's about the YouTube effect, shout out YouTube there effect. You go. Um, yeah. You you probably want to be on Twitter because there needs to be a dialogue about it, right? You're not necessarily going to get anywhere by putting a picture on Instagram or a video on TikTok. Um, if you're working with, um, 
you know, a lot of influencers are actors now, right? So you're working with one of those guys and it's a movie that's targeted at younger people. You want to be on TikTok. So, and I also say to my clients, it's better to do one thing really well than multiple things mediocre or mm. average, right? So like I said, find out where, think about it, do some research, talk to your publicist or your social media consultant, figure out where your audience lives, go there and kick ass at it. That's, that's my suggestion. Um, so I can't say like everyone should be on Twitter. Everyone should be on Facebook. I will say though, from a marketing standpoint, the best bang for your buck is meta. Okay. Got right. It. Like, um, Twitter doesn't, in my experience, Twitter does not convert to movie tickets. It does not convert to streams or downloads. Instagram's a little trickier because you can't click on a link in a post, but you can right. from a story or a bio. Um, but Facebook, I can go on and I can say like, I want women who are 45 to 55 and live in Des Moines and like knitting. And I can target my ads at those people. Right. Uh, Facebook gives you the most options and is also um, comparatively, like think about buying a billboard or a newspaper ad or a television commercial. It's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not unrealistic. Like if you have a budget of $500 and that's it, you can still get a pretty good outcome on Facebook for that, in my yeah. opinion. So Comple completely agree. That's been my experience yeah. as well. So and the, the if you're thing engaging about in paid, then I say yeah. go Facebook. I, 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 I agree with that completely because Thank their you. reach is still a billion people. Uh -huh. Even if it's not hip, it's still a billion people. Right. And a lot of people will things. say, well, you can't get young people on Facebook, but you can get their parents. Yep. That have the money. Right. Like, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I get on the phone with my mom and she's like, you know, I saw an Instagram ad for this thing the other day. And then yep. I go Google it. Right. So there's nothing wrong with getting parents on Facebook yeah. for something that might be youth targeted. I still think there's value in that. And they're connected. Like if you, if you got right. Facebook, then you have Instagram, you have WeChat or um, right. WhatsApp. Sorry. WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. And look like, so the, the cool thing about what I do as a publicist and social media strategist, right? Because at the end of the day, not every publicist is a social media savvy individual and not every social media person is a savvy publicist, right? Like right. I, there's some people I partner with frequently that I provide one of those services to support the other. I'm able to do both things, right? So when I'm practicing PR in the back of my mind, I can also think about how social media can support that. And when I'm practicing social media, I can think about how PR can support that, right? So I have that kind of setup for my business where one informs the other, one supports the other. And I think that that, you know, to be a little self-serving, I think that makes me a little more marketable in my space. Um, and, and it makes me more competitive. Like, obviously I'm competitive with my peers, with other freelancers, but I think it also allows me to be a little more competitive with agencies, right? Because agencies have departments and I am a one woman multi-department agency. And I do have, I do have colleagues that I hire on for larger campaigns, but all I'm saying is that my, my skill set is a little bit more broad than like your average publicist, freelance publicist. Yeah. It's one of the big reasons we wanted to have you on. Um, oh, but I do want to talk Thanks, to Chris. the clients, of course, a little bit more to, to just piggyback on what you said. Yeah. 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 Uh, for first time clients, like young or old, but first time clients, what are the key factors uh, to consider <laughs> when choosing a publicist? Well, let's be pragmatic. Budget, right? I, I certainly, like if you only have a certain amount of money, right? A lot of times I will turn business down and say, you're better off spending some money on really finely targeted Facebook ads. That's going to yeah. be more effective for you. Because even though I understand, appreciate, and respect the value of earned media, I understand that it's harder to tangibly show results from. I do understand that. Um, so, you know, I think budget is the first thing you got to think of. What is the best way for me to be successful financially? Like, where's the best place to throw my money? Beyond that, um, I recommend finding someone who can personally invest in your project where you're not just going to be a number amongst many clients. Mm. Um, 
find somebody who's good at replying to emails. You know, if, if a week goes by and you haven't heard from your publicist, that's really bad. That's really hard. That takes a whole bunch of time out of your campaign efforts. Um, I'm pretty good. I turn around emails at least within 24 hours, if not sooner. Um, my boyfriend would tell you that's a terrible thing because I'm constantly checking my phone, but <laughs> he's accepted it as a necessary yep. evil. Um, you know, I would find somebody who hopefully has some experience, right? Like if you're a documentary, uh, try to find a publicist who has a documentary experience, if not experience in the specific subject matter, right? Mm. Um, the other thing I have come across lately that's been really interesting is if you made a film about a marginalized community, try to find someone, if you can, from that community to work with you. Um, beyond that, so like when I say I've had experience with it, so I have worked this year actually with a couple documentaries about indigenous communities from white filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And I personally, I don't have a problem with that because I think it's important those stories get told, period. Um, yeah. However, I understand that if you're a Native American and your story is being told by a white person, that's probably, that's problematic. So I get that also. Yeah. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> the thing that might've been beneficial to those films, not to do a disservice to myself is if they could have found a, a publicist who was native American to speak to the value of the film that might've served them well in hindsight. I don't know. Look, you could, you, like I said, you can do all the right things and still have a negative outcome, but you know, so anyway, I, I, you know, find someone with a relevant experience, um, you know, talk about loving Star Trek. I got to work on the PR team for a documentary called For the Love of Spock mm -hmm. about the life of Leonard Nimoy. I mean, there couldn't be a more perfect film for me, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I've never wanted to do PR for a film more than I wanted to yeah, do it for that, that film. film. Yeah, yeah. Like, I went to the I went to the Saturn Awards on Tuesday night. The it's the, you know, the award show for science and sci-fi and horror and mm -hmm action movies and uh walked up to the will call to grab my seat assignments and the first person standing next to me I looked over was Denise Crosby who was on Star Trek the Next Generation yeah. and I grabbed my plus one and I was like I'm here in a professional capacity I'm here <laughs> in a professional capacity um so you know I could give a shit about meeting Tom Cruise but you put me next to Lieutenant Tasha Yar and it's over yeah, oh my god over, people right. are going to listen to this podcast and be like who is this person um <laughs> you 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 are us and and for those listening uh and that need a recap of that number one budget number two someone who can take that personal touch with you number three hire someone with relevant experience to to promote your thing yeah in that in that vein aj you worked on the film rampart uh, puncture. You worked on trespass. You're going way back. What yeah. were were there any novel PR approaches you used on those films that you can mention? Or novel strategies? Well, I was kind of low on the totem pole with those guys. Um, <clears throat> trespass is really interesting because it was one of the very first day and date films. It came mm -hmm. out exclusively on Directv the same day it came out in theaters. Yeah. At the time, I think it was 2011. At the time. That translated into this film's not very good. Um, nowadays, that happens literally every day. Um, so yeah, that is true. That was kind of the vibe back then. It's like, oh, why does right. it need that? Oh, yeah. it's a Nicolas Cage directed by yeah. Joel Schumacher. Um, it must not be that good. But it played at the Toronto Film Festival. It was a perfectly adequate action film that could have had a, a singularly theatrical release and been just fine. But because it had that model, which was just you know, ahead of its time, you know, it right. translated into a certain way. So that was really interesting. Um, Joel Schumacher, may he rest in peace, was a lovely human being. He used to call me peaches because <laughs> he liked, he liked my skin tone. Um, so anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, forward thinking. I don't know the, you know, with puncture, which starred Chris Evans, right. When he was starting to become super famous, um, you know, he was, I think the, he had just wrapped shooting the first Avengers movie when we were promoting that film. We did a lot of Q and A's like after screenings. Um, we, we leveraged his celebrity into getting people to show up for a small independent film. So that was, 
that was good. That happens all the time now yeah. with independent films. We do Q and A's, obviously not in the last couple of years, but when I was at Gravitas, we did Q and A's anytime we could. One, there's two reasons why you do that. One, it gets consumers to show up. Two, it gets the movie theater to help you promote the film because it's something they can eventize. Yeah. So it, it it brings them on to help you a little bit more fervently. Also, at the end of the day, it bleeds over into your on-demand, right? Because, hey, look, we had a really successful theatrical, so you should totally put us on the home page of iTunes movies. Yeah, yeah. People will be looking for this movie. So That, that home page is critical. Yeah, that marquee placement, the, you get you know, that first five... Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, have you ever talked sort of about thumbnails. alpha stacking? What's that? Alpha stacking. You no. know what that is? No. So alpha stacking is, um, so statistically speaking, if someone goes onto iTunes, um, Netflix or whatever, and they just, they don't know what they want to watch yet. Um, I think more often than not nowadays, people go with intent, but every now and then you go onto a platform and you're like, I don't know what I want to watch. I'm going to scroll I'm going to go to the action movies page and see what's what. So mm. Most of the time it's alphabetical, right? And people lose interest after they get to about C, A, B, C, or zero A, B, C, right? So alpha stacking is when you present a movie and you make sure that the title of it starts with one of those letters and you will make yeah. more money. Yeah. So, so so we were told to alpha stack. I didn't know the terminology, but. Yeah. And, um, and by the way, if all I, of our movies start with A for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it happens every day. It's maybe frowned upon. Like, I don't think, you know, let's just say charter cable. Um, you know, they probably don't love it. They have 8 million movies that start with a and two movies that start with Z. Right. right. But, um, I will say if your movie starts at the letter Z, you better have some good PR. Like, I know that sucks, but it's just going to be a little bit harder for you. But if your movie is really good and it gets a couple good reviews, you might be fine. But I'm just, you know, statistically speaking, if you want to be a little more minded that way, a little bit um, more strategic. it's easier if, you're, if your movie starts with A or the number one, you know what I mean? So, um, it's good. It's really, anyway, it's really I'm just good. kind of all over the place, but <laughs> you're fine. I love this. This is great information for, for not just me, but for the audience, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know I'm, how like sometimes you'll hear a celebrity say, I need to fire my publicist. Like whenever, mm -hmm. like they'll say it sarcastically. Yeah. Well, Do I you mean, ever look, say like everyone, to your client, every I need to fire you. Like what are the conditions for, oh, I need done to it. fire you. I've done oh, you it. have? Yeah, I've, I've fired clients and I don't like the word fired. Or like, drop them. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, you know, usually what I say is I need to terminate the retainer or I need to to conclude our, our business. Um, and it's not, in my experience, Fancy it's semantic. never been because it's never been because someone's an asshole, just to be clear, at least with me, right? Okay. I've been really lucky. I, I Look, one of the reasons I work for myself is because I can most of the time pick and choose my clients and I'm I'm a pretty good judge of character, right? So I've I've been really lucky. I haven't worked with a lot of assholes in the last four years. That but what good. does happen is I work with someone for X amount of time and I realize that I'm not, I'm not earning them any publicity. I'm just not doing a good job. And it's not my fault for lack of effort. It's not their fault for being who they are. There's just something that's not gelling or yeah. I don't have the press contacts that they need. So I certainly don't want to set anyone up for failure. I only want people to be successful. And at the end of the day, Mr. Client, I don't think I'm being successful for you. And I think it would benefit you to get publicity elsewhere. And sometimes I can refer them elsewhere. Sometimes I don't, I can't, I don't know. And I'll ask around for them. I'm never just going to abandon somebody, but you know, typically what I explain to people because it's true is you need publicity. I'm not working out. And it's almost like I'm firing myself from them. Got it. Because it's like when you're breaking up with someone and saying it's it's not you, it's me. Yeah. I mean, look, and, and it sounds cliche, but it's kind of true. And I'm also like, I'm sure there's there's less ethical publicists out there who don't have a problem with it, but I'm not out to steal anyone's money. Right. Yeah. So first of all, I never take on a client if I don't think I can be successful with it. That said, sometimes it ends up turning out that way anyway. Um, you know, I just, I put so much effort into it, so much time. But at the end of the day, I'm like, shit, 
This just isn't working and I don't want to keep taking their money. So that's when I pull that that cord and, and say those things and explain those things. Most of the time they're receptive. A couple times I've had someone say, you're firing me. And I'm like, I try not to see it that way. I understand you might feel that way. And in a way it's flattering because it means they don't want to let me go. But like I said, I want them to get publicity. I want them to be successful. You know, these people have mortgages, they have children, they have bills they have to pay. And, and what I'm doing for them is not helping that stuff at the end of the day. Right. So that's, that's how I quote unquote fire a client or drop a client or how I've had to, hasn't even happened that often, but, um, it has happened. Uh, I appreciate there's also, sharing that too. yeah, no, it's fine. I'm very open. Ask me anything. You know, I'll even say to your listeners, tweet at me, LinkedIn me. I love talking about what I do. I'm really lucky. I get to do what I like and I've been doing it for 16 years. So what I can talk the- about it all day. What are the two best pieces of advice, AJ, you've received so far in your career and who did they come from? Oh, well, not to be smug, but the best advice. So I do a lot of speaking to students. Um, Mm -hmm. I I guess speak at USC a lot, sometimes UCLA. Um, You are your own best publicist. So when it comes to... obviously you work for other people and you want to be their publicist, but in order to get those people to hire you, you have to brand yourself, right? No one advocates for you better than you. Nobody knows your accomplishments better than you. So Mm -hmm. don't, don't, don't consider it arrogant. Don't consider it, um, bravado or gravitas pun intended. (laughs) Uh, you are, you are your own best publicist. Get out there, tell people what you're good at, tell people what you've accomplished, Use your LinkedIn and and post about your professional achievements. Use your Twitter to talk about them. Use your Instagram to post pictures of them. Build your online portfolio so you can shoot people right over it to it. That is that is my favorite piece of advice that I give out the most often. I don't really know who gave it to me. It's maybe it's just something I've come up with based on my, you know, lengthy experience. But that is that is the chunk of advice I give out most often. Um, the other piece of advice, um, Again, not something somebody gave me, but something I have learned the hard way is, and this sounds so like simplistic, but it's be nice. Mm. Um, mm. And and that's that's advice to publicists as much as it is to filmmakers and clients. Because here's what happens. At the end of the day, if you're a dick to me, I, I don't give a shit if I succeed for you or not. I'll, you know, like I'm never going to give anyone little effort but mm-hmm. I will, for the clients that are just grateful and nice and friendly and warm, they'll get like 150% out of me, right? Like those are the clients I want to be successful for because they are so nice that I want to continue to make them happy. When you're an asshole, I'm just going to be like, well, here's my effort. Like <laughs> here's 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 what was in your proposal. I did not go above and beyond. Right. And like I said earlier, I've been really lucky I've chosen my own clients. I haven't really dealt with a lot of assholes, but in my experience, just be nice. Like say, thank you. Say, please Um, respond to an email. Um, You know, be honest with your clients and and tell them what's what in a nice way. Um, Teach them as much as they teach you and back and forth. So I guess those are my two pieces of advice. Uh, Serve yourself and, and be nice, be kind. What are the biggest creative and business mistakes you see newcomers making? Uh, newcomers? Well, can we talk about filmmakers specifically? Please, um, that'd be even better. So, uh, especially with independent filmmakers, because budgets are tight, mm-hmm. the biggest mistakes I see is that you cut corners to save money, and then you get to someone like me to do publicity, and you have no assets. You didn't mm-hmm. have an on-set photographer, so you have no stills, or nobody took... You can even just take some great pictures with your iPhone, but like nobody took pictures. Um, Nobody set up your social media early. So now your movie's done and you're putting it out there, but there's zero people online talking about it. Um, Even like, even if you get like your mom and 20 of her friends to follow you on Instagram, at least it looks like some people are following the film. Um, So I just think like, People cut corners to save money and sometimes you have to, and I get that, but I would say to avoid it. And I would also say to think long-term and uh, 
The other thing I, I think I see a lot of filmmakers do is something I call analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. Like just don't overthink things. You will think yourself into a corner or into a hole that you will never climb out of. Um, you know, weigh your options, pick the one that's the best and just lean into it. Uh, if you sit around and overthink it and say, oh, before I do this, I want to make sure I don't miss out on X, Y, and Z. I mean, you'll just spend all your time thinking and won't actually accomplish anything. Um, and it's perfectly okay to ask other people for their opinions, but at the end of the day, own your shit and, and make those decisions. That's, that's, those are mistakes I see um, to this day. So, and then the other, the other thing I see a lot of filmmakers do is they're so excited to be acquired by a distributor that they don't stop to read the fine print and they don't ask the right questions. So yeah. when you come on with a distributor, no matter, no matter how big or small, don't assume they will do anything for you. Ask, will you handle publicity for me or will you pay for me to hire a publicist? A lot of the times nowadays, the answer is no. So if you're expecting marketing, advertising, social media support, publicity, ask ask about that before you sign anything. Don't let anything surprise you. Yeah, um, and, and if is they're a respectable, yeah, anyway, if they're a respectable company, yeah. they'll they'll tell you. They'll yeah. tell you. And if they don't tell you, if they are dodgy about it or they don't want to give you a straight answer, jump ship, dude. It'll be worth much much better to go wait and go find someone else who yeah. can answer being those patient, questions. Yeah. Or, or find filmmakers who have worked with them in the past and just ask them if the, the distributor won't tell you or, or come to me and ask me if I've worked with them before, you know, just yeah. don't if, make if any they, rash if they, decisions. If they don't have referrals. That's a big red flag. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, don't make rash decisions just because you're excited. Yeah. Yeah. That's or because you feel like someone finally loves you. It's, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. We we talk about the fact that like a lot of filmmakers we've worked with in consults and branding and marketing and beyond will talk about their film as if it's their baby, their child, and they've and worked so hard on it. And yeah. it is, but then they're so quick to give their baby to anybody. That's, you a, would, that's a you, really good way to say it. And and the other thing uh, along the same lines is that after the film has come out and you've done everything you can to support it, they're afraid to let their baby go. Yeah. Like they're like, what else can we do? What yeah. else can we do to get more people to see this movie? And and honestly, at some point, like you got to move on to the next project. Yeah, like you yeah. you it's like that's why the strategy with a and limb all your is life so and, important. Yeah, it's living with a limb your whole life, and suddenly the limb is gone, and it's like, how do I just use one arm? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's it's I've seen it time and time again. The filmmakers don't know how to let go of their babies, and I get it. But like, that's another thing you have to. You have AJ, to you just sit there. You have been amazing with your information and your time. You. I knew you uh, would be, and I knew this would be an incredible conversation and super valuable for this audience. I want to put my, so you're welcome uh, for sure. And I really enjoyed the conversation. You're wonderful as well. Thank you. I'm so glad we finally did this. I know we have to do it again. We have to do a round two for sure. Sure. And I know we're going to be in touch I do want to put myself on the hot seat oh. since I have you here. I might as okay. well. And I, I, I thought about this and said, okay, I'll have the courage to ask this. So you can say whatever you want okay. and it, I will not take it uh, personally. Famous last words. <laughs> I'm going to listen. I'm going to be like a student. Okay. So if you were going to be the publicist for the Make It podcast, what Ooh. would you suggest we do? Oh, God. Um, if you had to, let's just say two or three things. Sure. Well, I think one thing that can be really we could be here all day with as many mistakes. I know, as I right? Made. I could write you yeah. a 30-page PR proposal. I can write anyone. Um, I think one thing that's really effective for podcasters is to have other podcasters on your podcast to like trade mm. off and talk about each other. <clears throat> I think that's really down. good, but, but not necessarily in your genre, right? Like go mm. after a different audience. Cause the people who know you, know you go find some people who don't know you. Um, I think that building a strong social media following is, is valuable for podcasts. I really like the guys like, um, I'm trying to think of an example, you know, like <clears throat> I think hypochondriac does it. Like if you go to their Instagram feed, there's, there's these beautiful photos of, 
you know, who the guest was that week, but it's mm-hmm. not just a photo. Like they also have like audio running through it of something they said on the episode. Yeah. Um, so you get like a taste. I think stuff like that is really cool. Just have like an aesthetically pleasing, um, audio pleasing social media following. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, and you're already doing this, but I think for podcasts that a visual component has become more important. A lot of people are doing it like this now and putting it on YouTube as well. Right. Um, you know, I have clients that hate that. Like, they're like, I don't want to put a shirt on, um, <laughs> you know, but I think, you know, I was sitting here half an hour before we started throwing all this makeup on my face because, you know, but, um, you know, I think having a visual component now is, is important. Um, other than that, you know, kind of what I said before, um, social media advertising, man, like, uh, what's, and what's more important to you? Do you want people to listen to a particular episode or do you want subscribers? So when you're, when you're executing your social media strategy, think about that. You have Mm -hmm. like a really great episode you want to drive people to and hope they subscribe. Is that the message or is your message subscribe to this podcast, right? So just make sure you have a clear call to action or a CTA. Yep. Make sure you think about that strategically and do that. Um, Or split your money in half and try both and see what works. Do a split test. Yeah. Yeah, Love it. Exactly. I love it. AJ, I love that. Chris. I appreciate you giving me that information, being honest and being brave along with me. And I've also loved this conversation. Can Can you tell this audience where they can find you on social media, find you on the internet, reach out to you directly, learn more about you, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, so strategically, I've made this very easy for people. My name is AJ Feuerman. I'm sure wherever you see this podcast, you'll see how to spell my name. So just AJ Feuerman at everything, Twitter, AJ Feuerman, Instagram, AJ Feuerman, ajfeuerman.com. Like everything is the same. I am very findable. Um, So please hit me up. Always happy to talk. Um, if you can't afford to work with me, I can probably refer you to someone you can't afford to work with. So I'm always happy to do that as well. Um, obviously I like talking, so (laughs) let's talk, (laughs) you know, I always, uh... um, what's the, there's a show on NBC, um, New Amsterdam. Yeah. 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 About the guy who ran the largest public hospital in the country. It's based on that. And his, Mm -hmm. his slogan is how can I help? And mm-hmm. I think that that's, that's where I come from. How can I help? If I can't help you, how can I help you find someone who can help you, right? Like Jerry Maguire, help me help you. And that's that. the role Tom Cruise got an Oscar nomination for. We just got full circle. Mm, what a, closure. What a, call, what a, what a callback and what a generous offer too, to just say, hey, if you can't afford me, I'll find someone that I will. Mean, Look, I, I might just awesome. I might just have opened Pandora's box. I'm gonna get like 50 messages tomorrow. I hope not, God. But uh, you know, I do try to get back to everyone. I tell the same thing to students when I speak to their classes. Like I will respond to you. So yeah. it just might not be in the next 24 hours because my clients come first, but I'll get back to you. I think it's incredibly generous. And for those listening, a uh, Fureman is spelled F-E-U-E-R-M-A-N. Yes. So very German. AJ Fureman. Yeah. It means fireman. Like it literally sure does. fireman. I'm it literally German, does. So and I, I did some research why. into the origins of my first name, which is actually Amanda, which is like, um, Amanda joy. Yes. It's like caring. Amanda is like caring. So I'm a caring, joyous fireman. fireman. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> yeah. uh, I love that. I love it. It's Thank fantastic. You. And we all um, know where Chris comes from. Well, yep, Chris, Christopher Reeves, and my middle name, full disclosure. No, but I mean I, I, biblically. I, I, oh, biblical Christ, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Christ. Well, Christ, it says it's Christ like. Christ. Uh, uh, <laughs> Wait, do you have siblings? <laughs> yeah, I'm the I'm the baby. I have two older. What is siblings. what are they named after? Who are they named after? Ooh. Um, I'll have to ask because I'm not sure. So my oldest sister's name is Angela. Okay. And that could be Angela Lansbury for all I know. And my middle sister's name is Michelle. And uh, I don't know why she was named Michelle. I I mean, look, sometimes people aren't named after anybody. They just like the name, but yeah. Anyway, we could talk all day, obviously. Let's get lunch. Yeah, we'll get lunch. And I'm going to start coming back out to LA a lot more. I 
I know you're the brunch queen. My spot is in the alcove. Follow Hollywood Brunch on Instagram as well. By all means, brunch on IG. Absolutely. I great pictures, by the way. And (laughs) I used to always go to the alcove, and then now I've been I've been told the alcove is like quote unquote like a scene. A scene now, like it's like you're going there to yeah. But delicious is delicious. You can still go there. Yeah, I'm so depressed about it. I'm like, where am I going to go now? Where else? If I pick another spot, where do I go besides Ooh. the alcove? Is that the vibe you like? I mean, I always I like recommend... alcove vibe. Yeah, I like the patio. Yeah, go to situation. Aroma in Studio City. Ooh, I'm right. That terrific. Aroma's great. Um, ugh, the place I always used to recommend is gone now, but uh, damn pain. I don't know if you want simple like it's a lot of cute little diners like Patty's Diner in Toluca Lake. Mm-hmm. Um, no, oh, that sounds self, they're my client. That sounds self-serving. Um, <laughs> but it <laughs> it's is really good. It's good. You just said yeah. delicious, delicious. Um, you know, uh, uh, God, I'm spacing on all of this, but you know, I, I also really like just going to the farmer's market at the Grove Love a good and just like market. walking around and seeing like mm-hmm. what entices me. There's also, um, they just put in this really cute Mexican restaurant right outside the Grove, uh, right outside the farmer's market called, El Granero Cantina. Um, and the patio is delightful. The decor is delightful. The food is delicious. I actually just posted a picture of it on my brunch Insta and highly recommend that too. I know you're trilingual. You have English, Hebrew, and Spanish. What is what does that word mean in the middle of that Mexican restaurant? Granero? I, Granero, you know what? I don't know. My Spanish is not fluent, but I think grand, like the grand oh. cantina, like the, I think. Okay. We'll look it up. Well, yeah. Now we have homework. Now you have homework. Uh, and and uh, so does this audience. Uh, after all we've dropped on them today. Uh, if you guys want to know more about AJ, you, you heard where you can find her on social, reach out to her directly. If you want to know more about the Make It podcast, that's easy. Just go to www.bonsai.film and you will find as much as you want to find on our podcast, not just our guest interviews, but our series that we have let out like Mistakes in the Making and Industry Insights and the Film Investment Series. So all valuable resources for filmmakers trying to quote unquote make it. And AJ, uh, this has been a blast. I cannot wait to be in LA again and have brunch slash lunch with you. I likewise, I look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me. Anytime. We're going to talk soon. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Count on it. Okay. Bye, everyone. (laughs) Thank you. Bye. 